Okay, um, so let's start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Astrid Maurice Akalan. Um, I work at Bankwest Curtin Economic Center based at Curtin University in Perth. Um, I'm um, also part of the committee of the Western Australian branch of Women in Economics Network. Um, on behalf of the Women in Economics Network, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this first keynote session of the 2021 uh, Australian Gender Economics Workshop. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which those of us participating from Australia are based today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. So this session will last for an hour with the opportunity to have your questions answered at the end of the keynote address. Please type your comments and questions during or after the presentation by using the Q&A box at the bottom. If there are questions already raised that you'd like to see answered, you are also able to vote for them. So gender equity appears to be one of those social issues that just won't go away. And as COVID-19 continues to, to affect the lives around the world, we can already see that the pandemic and its economic fallout are having significant effects on gender equality. Today's keynote speaker has been at the forefront of gender economic analysis of the effects of the pandemic and has already contributed a significant amount of published work in this area. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jana van der Mullen Rogers. Jana is a professor at the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations and in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. She also serves as faculty director of the Center for Women and Work at Rutgers. Jana obtained her BA in economics from Cornell and her PhD in economics from Harvard before moving into a distinguished career as an internationally recognized leader in research on women's health, labor market status and well-being through quantitative analysis of large data sets. Jana has published extensively in referee journals, along with numerous chapters, reports, and edited volumes. Her first book, Maternal Employment and Child Health, examined the link between women's economic empowerment and children's nutritional status. Her second book, The Global Gag Rule and Women's Reproductive Health, estimated the impact of global gag rule on women's abortion rates around the globe. Jana has advised organizations such as the World Bank, the United Nations, and the Asian Development Bank, and was president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. She serves as an associate editor with the journals World Development and Feminist Economics. And as if all of this wasn't enough, Jana is a mother of three and a marathon runner. As a mother of two who has given up on the idea of staying in shape years ago myself, I have no idea how she manages to do all of this. Where, warm welcome to the Australian Gender Economics Workshop, Jana. The floor, or I guess rather the screen is yours. Well, thank you so much, Askik, and thank you very much to uh, the network of um, women economists in Australia for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, share my screen for the PowerPoint. Um, I will show you my sources at the end. I've combined um, data from a number of um, sources, some of them my own work and some from the uh, International Labor Organization and others to uh, provide a detailed look at the impact of the pandemic and then a care-led uh, recovery plan for the pandemic. So um, most of you are acutely aware that there are gender dimensions of the uh, pandemic. And what I'd like to highlight is some current uh, available data sources that show some of these disadvantages and, and where this information is coming from. So what we'll be looking at today in this uh, keynote address is first gender differences in the incidence of COVID-19 as well as in mortality rates. And then we'll be turning to some of the socioeconomic impacts and women's uh, disproportionate um, losses and uh, their disproportionate hardships. So we'll look first at the relatively high representation of women in frontline jobs uh, especially among healthcare workers, uh, home health aides, and other low wage essential jobs. And we'll see that many of these women are um, in minority groups. Also, women are disproportionately employed in some of the industries and occupations that have had the most severe business shutdowns, which meant more job losses for women than men. And 
more recent data is showing that women are exiting the labor force uh, more than men in order to take care of children who are being homeschooled and who are also home because daycare centers are still closed. And then we'll turn to unpaid care work and I'll show you some new evidence that uh, my team at Rutgers collected showing the relatively uh, larger burden for women than men and some interesting results on um, job satisfaction and job productivity. And then we'll finally talk uh, before going into the care-led plan for recovery, uh, some information on uh, intimate partner violence and reproductive health care access. Uh, to, I know many of you are probably multitasking right now. I thought one thing we could do before um, having more engagement at the end with comments and questions is to do some poll questions so you can see where you stand in relation to others. So halfway um, during uh, some of my discussion of the evidence, we'll do some poll questions so you can compare yourself with others and we'll have some more poll questions at the end. So please do keep a listen if you are multitasking um, for the poll questions and it would be great if you could participate. So uh, in terms of the um, recommendations, they really do focus on care and the need for care because what this crisis has pointed to is attention on both paid care provided by healthcare workers as well as um, all kinds of different paid care, not just health care, as well as unpaid care happening in the home. Um, and decades of feminist scholarship has really highlighted how this care work is often undervalued and invisible, um, but we can turn to some of this scholarship in shaping lessons for strategies that governments can adopt and employers around the globe can adopt as they try to navigate the recovery period. Um, so the first bit of evidence I wanted to um, bring to your attention, um, this is an image that or a chart is coming um, out uh, any day now in the introduction of the Journal of Feminist Economics, we have a special issue on COVID-19 that literally is being released any day now. And in our introduction, uh, one of the things we looked at was the disproportionate um, uh, effect or the, the harder hit are actually men. On average, uh, men are getting more COVID uh, reported cases in the majority of countries than women. So here, the bars that are in dark blue is the percent of cases that are uh, born by women and light blue is by men. And you can see that in the majority of countries, um, men have more COVID-19 cases than women. When we did an average, uh, just an, a weighted average of um, countries by the reported cases, uh, men account for of these 112 countries uh, just over half of all reported cases, 51.3%, and women of 48.7% of cases. And that imbalance is greater if you look at mortality caused by COVID-19. Men account for 58.1% of the deaths. Um, and some countries that are reporting it have higher rates also for minority groups as well as low-income individuals. So that data is a bit harder to come by. And the medical literature is indicating that uh, there's a number of reasons for men's greater morbidity and mortality, and they include more risk behaviors that men adopt, like smoking and drinking. They also have more comorbidities, like heart disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Uh, they're less likely to practice safe health um, habits like washing their hands or uh, seeing a primary care physician for regular physical physicals, and some evidence suggesting that their immune systems are less effective in fighting viruses. 
Um, turning next to some of the evidence on um, people working in essential jobs or frontline jobs, like grocery store clerks, um, drivers and uh, conductors in public transportation, uh, logistics like trucking, um, postal service, also cleaning services, healthcare, um, childcare. These are all considered frontline industries. Uh, there's less readily available data here. Um, I was able to find some from the US that indicates just over 64% of essential workers are women. And um, people of color are also disproportionately represented among these workers. Something like 41% of frontline workers are people of color compared to their overall share in the workforce of 36.5%. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's harder to get this data globally. Um, we were able to find some data for nurses who um, have some of the greatest risk of all occupations to uh, exposure to COVID-19, as well as stress on the job and depression. And that data shows that across regions, uh, women constitute the vast majority of nurses. It's as high as 86% in North and South America, and the lowest is still well over half. In um, Africa, women are 65% of um, nurses. So um, this is some indication of essential workers then who are women. Uh, in terms of employment losses, um, many of you have probably seen data in your own countries that women are bearing a larger proportion of uh, employment losses or they're seeing a greater change in uh, employment. And this is data that we found from the International Labor Organization. Uh, again, I have the sources at the end um, showing, I think it's 21 countries in most of these countries women have larger drops in employment than men. There's only a couple of exceptions. And then the ILO also looked at uh, labor income and this was adjusted uh, also for income transfers. And the countries they looked at, they showed that in all countries except for the UK, um, women's labor income was uh, bigger and a lot of that again is because of um, losses in employment that are relatively bigger than for men. Um, so two big reasons for these employment losses, uh, again, which disproportionately hit women um, and racial and other ethnic minority groups. Uh, one is that they were largely employed before the pandemic started in sectors that ended up having the most business closures, especially entertainment, um, hotel industry, food services, social services, um, secretarial and other clerical jobs, wholesale and retail trade, and labor intensive manufacturing, which took a big hit when um, trade and manufactured goods slowed down because of the decline in demand due to recession. So um, there's a global statistic, again, from the ILO. They've been really good with uh, coming out with timely data. 40% um, of all women workers around the globe, compared to 36.5% of men workers, were employed in industries that were hardest hit um, by closures uh, during the pandemic. Um, a second big reason for employment losses, and we're hearing more about this as the pandemic wears on, is um, women leaving the labor market entirely in order to homeschool their children and to provide other kinds of caring labor. Um, and again, referencing the ILO, they did a really um, informative decomposition of employment losses to support that argument. That's what's shown in this chart here, um, that overall, uh, there was uh, a little bit, again, globally, more than 4% employment decline globally, and um, 
much of that is accounted for by labor force exits as opposed to people being officially unemployed and looking for other work. And women, you can see, carry a heavier burden of this than men. Overall, women uh, lost 5% um, of their jobs. Uh, employment losses amount to 5%. And the vast bulk of that is because of labor force exits for women than men. And that's a higher amount, absolutely, and relatively compared to men um, due to the pandemic. Turning next uh, to some evidence on a uh, time use and unpaid care work, I did see on the program that um, at least one paper is looking at this um, at this workshop. Um, and we've seen it, some of you are probably doing this work also, or you've seen it coming out um, from colleagues that are publishing, and even in the newspapers, there's been so many um, stories in the press that men and women are doing more work at home, uh, but uh, women are doing disproportionately more. Um, there's uh, some really good data that UN Women recently put out together with Women Count for Asia and the Pacific. And they showed, um, and I'm about to see, show you the chart on the next slide, that uh, both men and women uh, reported doing more unpaid care work as well as more unpaid domestic work um, since the pandemic started, um, at least one activity per day. And you can see that even more women than men reported this increase, 60% versus 54% for care work, and then 63 versus 59 for domestic work. And this is people who reported doing more of it since the pandemic started. And then if we um, change the measure slightly to at least three of these kinds of activities and consider that the intensity of work, 30% um, of women reported more intense um, domestic work and care work compared to 20% of men. And that is, uh, those are um, weighted averages of um, this country by country uh, depiction of their data. And this is again coming from UN Women um, and um, counting women. And I also have that source at the end. And what these um, bars show is um, performing at least one activity of care work or domestic work. And um, the percent of men and women who saw an increase in that. And the little circles show the intensity of that work. So at least three activities doing more since the pandemic started compared to before. And you can see that just about uh, for every single country, there's a higher percentage for women than there is for men um, in both uh, the one activity as well as at least three activities. So that's really, and um, this source, uh, UN Women and the, the Counting Women's Work in Asia, um, it, it's all online. They have a whole bunch of other indicators on the pandemic, things like mental health, um, physical health, um, employment losses, and they're all for um, countries in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, really good data if you're looking for data. So um, when we started seeing this happening early in the pandemic at Rutgers, I got together with um, four of my colleagues and then an outside scholar, and we decided to do our own rapid response survey back in May last year when the pandemic was still fairly new. And we got a sample of 920 people, uh, adults living with opposite sex partners. And we used a survey instrument that Gretchen Donahauer at UC Berkeley um, put together. And she got some great uh, suggestions from Nancy Fulbray, uh, one of the gurus on time use. So we used Gretchen's survey uh, instrument, and then we um, uh, made some amendments to it and added some additional questions. 
Uh, but her survey, if you're looking for an instrument and don't want to start from scratch, her survey is also available online. Um, and I can send you that link if you're interested. And um, the uh, survey, the questions that we added um, were a couple on job satisfaction and job productivity. And I thought it might be interesting to do a poll. So here's your cue. Uh, to do a poll and to see how you compare with others who are on um, this session right now, the keynote address. So I have uh, three questions here and um, Di, Diane is helping us with uh, doing this poll. So if you can please ask or um, enter how productive you are in your paid job during the pandemic compared to before the pandemic. Are you more productive, less productive, or about the same? And perhaps it might not be applicable to you. And you have, um, let me see, I think we're taking a minute. I can't remember exactly. So um, it looks like votes are still coming in. And if you're not at your computer, if you could please run to your computer and do the poll. It'd be interesting to see um, how people rank. And I think we're gonna close it at a minute if, if I'm correct in my recollection. So it looks like most people were about the same, 38% about the same, 35% less productive, 25% um, more productive, and then um, one person was not applicable. Okay, so now you see where you compare. And we have another question on job satisfaction. Um, so similar question, how satisfied are you with your job during the pandemic compared to before the pandemic? Are you more satisfied, less satisfied, or about the same, or not applicable? And we'll take another minute. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, looks like results are trickling in now, but overall, it seems like there's quite a bit less satisfaction. So, People, some people may be more productive, but they're still less satisfied. This one's standing out a lot more. Um, and about the same at 28%, 25% are more satisfied, but most of you um, of the four responses are less satisfied than before the pandemic. And two people said not applicable. Okay, and then the last question uh, for now, is are you providing child care and or elder care at least five hours per day during the pandemic? Um, let us know where you stand on this one. Okay, interesting. Okay, so looks like most of the results are in, uh, about 80%, a little over 80% are not providing any um, care for children or elders, and uh, almost 20% of you are providing care. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we'll do three more questions at the end. And um, I'm going to continue now with um, the next slide. So let me see if I can close that. All right. Okay, so um, let me tell you what we found in our um, survey in the US, it was US data. As we expected, both men and women were working more on paid work um, but it rose more for women than it did for men. Um, one thing we did was ask people, respondents, and there were both male respondents to our questionnaire as well as, um, as women respondents, and we asked them to put in a number 
of uh, how much of the unpaid work are you doing? How much is your partner doing? And when men answered that question, um, they reported that their own share increased from 45 to 48% and that their women partners were doing less. But when women reported how much they were doing, they reported a whole lot more. Um, they said they were doing 65% uh, before the pandemic and that rose to 66%. And they evaluated that their male partners were also doing less, um, but absolute numbers were also lower. So men thought that they were doing more than what women were reporting that their male partners were doing. So not only did these results um, show the unequal gender distribution of work going on in the home, but also differences between men and women in their perceptions of who was doing what. And um, that's consistent with a couple of uh, studies we found in the past, um, perceptions of who's doing what in the home. So again, one of our key results that we were not surprised to find was that um, women were still performing more during the pandemic. Um, telecommuting, interestingly, uh, the share of people who uh, were telecommuting uh, more than doubled relative to before the pandemic. Um, and we did not find any gender differences in the rate of telecommuting that were statistically significant. We did find some things that surprised us. Um, our data actually showed that men were spending more time caring for the elderly and disabled compared to women, um, both before and uh, during the pandemic. And we found that when men did more unpaid work at home, that contributed positively to women's job satisfaction and their productivity. So here are just some descriptive statistics from our um, survey. And this shows the percent of men and women who were doing at least five hours of active childcare per day, or at least five hours of um, housework per day. And um, the blue bars are before uh, the pandemic and the orange bars are after. And here you can uh, clearly see the gender differential both in childcare and in housework. Um, this next slide we were not expecting to see um, that both men and women, as we expected, are doing more care for the elderly and for disabled, but men are actually doing more than women. Um, and we were not expecting to see that. So that was one of our surprising uh, results. And the other surprising result that we found, uh, we did some very simple uh, logit regressions and we regressed um, our dependent variable was women's uh, work productivity and their job satisfaction during the pandemic. Um, and we had a number of regressors, including men's contribution to caring labor in the home. And we found that as men do more unpaid work in the home, women report a higher odds of being more productive in their paid jobs and being more satisfied with their paid jobs. When we did the reverse way of uh, looking at men's job satisfaction and men's job productivity, uh, what women did at home had no relationship or no association with men's job productivity and satisfaction. So the relationship held only for women respondents, not for men respondents. And we then um, plotted out um, the likelihood of um, men's contributions in the household contributing to women's um, job productivity. And this is the relationship that you can see. So again, as men do more in terms of their household contributions, women's job productivity during the pandemic has uh, increased. Um, the last, uh, before I turn to um, policy recommendations and plans for recovery, the last kind of care dimensions and gender dimensions of the pandemic um, have less global evidence that I can find, but I know people are writing about this. 
and one is on intimate partner violence. There's a lot of attention to this in the media um, that indicates domestic violence and, and intimate partner violence are increasing. It's harder to find cross-country data. I do know in our special issue of feminist economics, one of our contributors um, or one article is by Shu and Henke. Again, this is just coming out any day now. They um, collected really unique data for the US from police reports, and they found an increase of 6% in domestic violence as a result of shelter in place orders in the US in a one month period uh, early in the pandemic. Um, other people are writing about reduced access to reproductive health care because of um, lockdowns and procedures being declared um, non-essential and um, other reasons why people cannot get out of their home because of the COVID pandemic. And um, the University of the Philippines, together with the United Nations, uh, put out a report showing that in the Philippines, there were um, an additional 751,000 unintended pregnancies because of lack of access to sexual and reproductive health services. And that's huge. And that in turn can have long-term impacts on uh, especially women's um, unpaid workloads at home. Um, I've also done a little bit of research on access to abortion services uh, in the US. Um, and that's where 12 states early in the pandemic um, declared abortion to be non-essential. Um, but of course, it's very difficult to delay abortion services. It effectively acts as a ban on an abortion. And our research is showing that this has disproportionately hurt um, women of minority backgrounds, um, Hispanic and black women. Uh, additional research is um, showing um, that there is also intersectionality by disability status. Again, I've looked at this for the US and others are looking for other countries. And it shows that people with disabilities have been hit harder by job losses compared to people without disabilities. And people with disabilities who are women and minority do even worse. Uh, in terms of job losses during the pandemic. And then finally, um, research is also showing that domestic workers uh, who are largely women have also been disproportionately hard hit by the pandemic in terms of employment losses, more abuse, um, not having access to personal protective equipment while working and being exposed to the disease and then some, depending on their countries of origin and countries where they're working, have been in legal limbo because they've lost their jobs but have been unable to travel back because of travel restrictions. And the special issue of feminist economics that's coming out has a couple of papers on domestic workers if you're interested in that topic. Um, so that's all I want to say about um, new evidence uh, supporting some of these gender dimensions. Uh, I think um, most of you would probably not argue when I say that it's essential to have a care-led recovery plan where we absolutely have to recognize the gender division of um, paid work and unpaid work. And that is a crucial part of any economic system that provides, um, that promotes human well-being. And this is what we need to frame policy responses around. And one of the most important components of any kind of effective recovery plan has to be um, care for children and the elderly. So universally accessible, free child care and long-term elder care should be a centerpiece of any care-led recovery plan as well as more investments in quality childcare services and elder care services. Um, the US is one of the few countries in the world that still does not have paid parental leave at the national level. Uh, we have it in some states, but not nationally. Um, most other countries have very generous parental leave and family leave. 
Um, so it should be strengthened where it needs to be, um, as well as sick leave benefits. Um, so that last statement there is mostly true for the US, but other countries uh, need to evaluate to see where corrections are needed. I think another key message is that this is not the time for austerity, now's the time to support workers. So it's important to boost unemployment insurance and to raise the minimum wage uh, whenever it's below a living wage. Um, investment in employment and training programs is also important, especially when these jobs are in healthcare. Um, most countries have a shortage of nurses. This is the time to invest in training and employment in more nurses. And finally, subsidies to small businesses will also help to create new jobs where they are needed. Um, stimulus spending also needs to be directed towards domestic violence prevention and support initiatives. And we need to uh, prioritize reproductive health care instead of calling it non-essential. Um, universal health insurance coverage is one of the goals in the United Nations, um, the SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and now is uh, a better time than ever for countries to move towards this goal, especially uh, when it comes to improving access for marginalized groups. Uh, domestic workers have been excluded from many uh, national laws covering other kinds of workers, uh, and that has made them vulnerable to wage theft and abuse and poor working conditions. So in the US, some states have passed a domestic worker bill of rights. I think this can be used in other countries as well and we could have it at the national um, level. And I know um, our new vice president has uh, suggested a domestic worker bill of rights in the past when she was still Senator. Um, we also need expedited um, path for permanent resident status for um, domestic workers, as well as having them included rather than excluded from emergency assistance payments. And then for essential workers, they need extra support too during the crisis before it, it ends, emergency stipends and support for childcare. Um, one of the papers that I um, wrote recently with um, my new co-author, Jennifer Cohen, uh, we looked at the origins of personal protective equipment shortages all over the world and how they um, really hurt healthcare workers, most of whom are nurses. And we came up with a set of recommendations in our paper on um, ensuring adequate uh, PPE. And here you can see some of the recommendations that we made. Um, and one thing, I don't know how true this is for many other countries, but in the US, we found that um, hospitals actually um, are not, um, their incentives are such that they do not keep adequate PPPE inventories because of a profit motive. And um, it's crucial to remove that profit motive so that hospitals have the incentive to stock larger PPE inventories for their staff. And governments need to strengthen their capacity to not only maintain PPE stockpiles, but to distribute it in um, a cohesive and equitable way. We also need better enforcement of regulations around PPE, um, including, and this is related to women, um, having the right size for each worker. Um, women on average are smaller in stature and not all the PPE fits them properly. Um, and we need new regulations to reduce stress and fatigue among healthcare workers. And that's all part of protecting them. And then our last few recommendations deal with the national level, the government coordinating supply, supplies and distribution and considering a strategic industrial policy so that uh, individual countries are no longer as dependent on the global supply chain for PPE. Um, that's largely China 
China is by far the largest uh, exporter of PPE. And um, that was one of the sources of the crisis when um, China first had COVID-19, they stopped exporting PPE and that caused major, sh major shortages all over the globe, including the US. Um, so far I've mentioned a lot of um, policies for the government, but it's not only the government's responsibility to um, help workers and uh, to lead the recovery, employers have a lot of work to do also. And at the top of the list is they need to offer more family friendly workplace policies and also destigmatize the use of these policies. So I'm pretty optimistic that telework is here to stay and it should be now that employers have learned it can be used effectively, uh, but also job sharing, flex time and more paid leave policies as well as um, other uh, measures like in academia, a longer clock for tenure or promotion. And they also need to recognize some of the benefits of having a more diverse workforce and greater inclusion in their workforce. And this is not only inclusion by gender, but also race, ethnicity, disability, and LGBTQ plus status. And finally, and then uh, we'll return to the other half of our poll, um, other priorities include collecting more sex disaggregated data. Um, as you can see, I had limited data and that's a sign of just how very little sex disaggregated data there's been and that's available on a timely basis. And that needs to be used in the decision-making, especially data on domestic violence. It's so hard to come by. Um, women's organizations and women's voices need to be included in recovery efforts. Um, and some of the successful plans also highlight the synergies between the um, environment and a green recovery as well as a care-led recovery. And all hate and violence and oppression against women, gender diverse people, and indigenous, black, and racialized communities needs to be addressed. There's a couple of organizations that are getting attention for having a feminist plan or a care-led plan already um, published. Uh, one leader in this area is the state of Hawaii. They have a plan online. Um, the Women's Policy Group in Northern Ireland has published a plan. There's a Canadian plan. Even the leading medical journal, The Lancet, has called for a feminist economic agenda for the World Health Organization. Um, there's a nonprofit um, effort in the US um, signed on by some celebrities that's been getting press recently called the Marshall Plan for Moms. And um, when I was preparing this talk, I saw that the um, Australian government through the Minister for Women um, has issued a women's economic security statement for the year 2020, which is uh, a care-led recovery plan as well. So um, that's all that I have prepared. I wanted to end uh, before we have a discussion with three more poll questions. So um, here's the first of our polls. Have you seriously considered leaving the workforce or have you left the workforce since the pandemic started? Um, yes or no? And maybe we can now do 30 seconds instead of a whole minute, um, given that we are um, close to time. Wow, it looks like, um, let me see if the response is coming in. Um, six people, 12% have seriously considered or have left the workforce and 88% have not. Interesting. Um, the next question for the poll. Have you uh, been teleworking during most of the pandemic so far? Um, mostly yeses. A few sums, a um, couple of no's. Wow, this is um, rather spread out. 
and a couple not applicables. Okay, I thought there would be more. Um, so we had 69% saying yes, uh, people teleworking during most of the pandemic, 21% doing some and 8% no. And then the last question is, um, has your employer changed your work expectations in a substantive way during the pandemic? Things like a delayed tenure clock, more flexibility or reduced workload. How many of you work for flexible, understanding, caring employers? <laughs> Most of you do not. Oh, it's unfortunate. Um, not applicable, 8%. It looks like close to 60%. Okay, 58% of you work for employers that have made no changes in their work expectations and 34% of you um, do have uh, understanding employers. That's interesting. Okay, so that is the end of, oh, I do have um, two slides that um, if you're interested, um, let me see if I can go back um, on sources and maybe I can make this or um, Aspik, you can make this presentation available later if people are interested in the sources and the links. So I'm going to stop the screen share. And um, I guess this is time for discussion and Q&A. Thank you very much, Jana, for this very insightful presentation. Uh, the presentation is being recorded and it will be available at some point um, online. So there will be the opportunity to access uh, the, the material. Um, so let's start. There are a number of questions that have arrived. Let's start with a question from Alison Preston from the University of Western Australia. Um, so you showed us that male domestic work had a positive effect on female perceptions of job productivity and that for males, female domestic work had no positive effect on male perceptions of job productivity. There's a literature which shows that male have a marriage premium, which we understand relates to the productivity effects derived from spouse. Do your logic findings therefore surprise you? Alison is asking. Um. I was not surprised. I think the productivity effect that's coming from the, the literature that I know, that's coming from the wage effect so that men earn more in the workplace in terms of wages um, and that they're getting a wage premium for being married. And I think that's this long standing breadwinner um, model and, and norms in the workplace. Um, I think this, the work happening within the home and men's perceptions of how productive they are, um, I think that may be a little bit different from this, the premium uh, in terms of their wages. Of course, wages are related to productivity but I think the perceptions of productivity and the actual outcome in terms of wages are a little bit different. So I wasn't too surprised by our results, which is consistent with women's work is often invisible. So we, you know, women can do more and more work at home and that work may be invisible even to their partners that it's not really impacting their male partners um, perceived productivities. Thank you, Anna. Another thing that uh, Alison um, make another point that Alison makes as a comment is the the fact that there have been cross country differences um, in the employment effects, but in, also in all sorts of effects of the pandemic. And she, she highlights the spe specific case of Australia. But I would like to build on that, that comment uh, just to ask you, based on your cross-country work, what are the countries that we see have done better in terms of mitigating uh, the, the gender inequality-related consequences of COVID-19, either through the de deliberate you know, policy responses or through, you know, through the nature of their you know, more structural uh, factors? Uh, and what can we learn from them? why have been these countries doing better? Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, one 
thing that we found um, in editing the special issue feminist economics, we had two papers showing that countries with women leaders actually did better in containing the virus and in having stronger outcomes. And one of those papers showed that women leaders were more likely to invest in the healthcare sector. So investments in um, social services and in healthcare is strongly related to having better outcomes as well as having women leaders. So that would be the main way I would answer that question. Thank you. Another question from Sylvia Salazar from uh, Bankwest Curtin Economic Center. Um, so have you looked at the gender division in domestic work for couples where the men went into unemployment and the women did not? I wonder how the division of housework was modified by it. Also, have you looked at the distribution of housework in the tales of the time distribution? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Unfortunately, our sample was too small in order to look uh, we did have some cases where uh, women kept working and their male partners were no longer working, but we didn't dig down so deep to look at those cases because they were very small cells, sample sizes. Um, but it's a very interesting question. And um, yeah, we did not, um, again, have you looked at the distribution of housework in the tales? Um, we did not but I, I think it's a good question to look at. And the paper is still under review at a journal. So this should be something that we should look at in the next go around. Yeah. Um, thank you. So I, I uh, just another question for, for uh, from me. Uh, so as you noted, this um, invisibility of um, care, you know, care work has been a big theme in the literature um, and in just the discourse in this area and more generally. Um, uh, but uh, one, I mean, this may be a bit trivializing the state of things, but one impression that I have generally is that the COVID-19 actually, at least for a certain group of the population, has made the, the care work more visible. I mean, we know anecdotally, you know, children popping up in people's screens and um, so forth. Uh, so is that actually, do you think that is the case? And this has actually, the one thing about this is that this has been the case for both men and women. So regardless of, you know, people's actual caring roles, there has been just generally more visibility that workers also perform care, um, care roles. So do you see this um, as uh, something tangible? Um, and if so, what, what, what kind of implications this may have in our society? I do see it as a silver lining in the cloud that the overlap between paid work and unpaid work is now much more visible. It's invisible, it, it is more visible, not only for women, but also men, and it's more visible for employers. And that's the part where I'm optimistic that employers are now less likely to stigmatize the mommy track, so to speak. And um, they're going to uh, be more flexible and um, have more of these employer provided policies that I mentioned. So I am optimistic that um, it's not just that men are now seeing women's work and valuing it, it's that employers are, and that we are going to see some institutionalization of telework and taking leave and prioritizing family and that it won't be stigmatized as much as it was before. Thank you. Um, another question from Leonor Riz uh, from RMIT University. Um, uh, so thanks, Yana, for a terrific presentation. Uh, when proposing these practical policy initiatives for a care-led recovery, how likely do you think it is that governments will realistically implement these policies? In Australia, for instance, the Australian government still places a heavy focus on infrastructure projects rather than investment in care. Can feminist economics offer insights into what works to persuade policymakers? Um, well, I... I... I wish I knew more about Australia. Maybe, Asti, if you can um, address that in the Australian case. But I'm really optimistic in the US with the new Biden-Harris administration. There's a lot more talk. We now have a new council on gender equity um, that um, is promoting all kinds of policies to promote gender equity. There is finally discussion of having a national um, paid 
family leave um, policy and an increase in the minimum wage and more affordable childcare. So many of the policies that I mentioned were part of the Biden-Harris platform. And I'm optimistic now that we have this new council on gender equity and we have women in high leading or high level positions in the government that a number of these policies we will see in the US and broadening it to other countries. I do think that as we see more women in leadership positions in other countries, um, it's going to make a difference in getting these kind of policies. And women are rising up, but yeah, I'm optimistic. And maybe you can uh, speak to that in the Australian case. Um, <laughs> we may need to wait for the next elections then. <laughs> Um, so a question from Rebecca Castles from uh, Bank West Curtin Economic Center. Um, the difference in perceptions of who is doing what in the home is something that has been part of the household dynamics for some time now. Male partners believe they're doing their fair share, but female partners often don't agree. Do you think these gaps in perceptions will be narrower now? Hmm, um, that's a really good question. Um, well, men are doing more. So um, yes, I do think the gaps in perceptions and I um, hope that things don't go back to the way they used to be once the pandemic ends. I know there's been concerns that you know women are now more likely to drop out for homeschooling and to take care of children. And there's worries that when they go back to the labor force that they're going to go back into lower paying, lower status jobs. Um, so it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I tend to be an optimist. So I'd like to think that the gaps in perceptions will be narrower now. Um, especially because people are, you know, they're at home, uh, if they're not essential workers, observing each other and how much exactly they're doing. And in um, heterosexual relationships, men are now seeing with their own eyes just how much work women are doing and what it takes to take care of children. So I do think that this unpaid work will be appreciated more than it was before. Um, thank you. So one uh, perhaps last question because we are running out of time. Uh, so there is some UK evidence that suggests the pandemic has affected women's mental health more negatively than men. I was wondering if you have looked at whether there is any relationship between increases in care and mental health declines for women. Um, that's one thing that I saw in that one data source um, from UN Women and the Counting Women. They looked at mental health uh, in the sample of, I think it was eight Asian countries and also saw like what it suggested here that women were more likely to report negative mental health effects than men. Um, whether there's relation between the increases in care. Oh, um, I think, yes, the, the stress. I mean, we've seen that documented for paid care workers in the case of nurses, that nurses have some of the highest stress levels among all occupations and, um, and they are providing you know, frontline care. So I definitely think there's that relationship. And um, I know my co-author Jen Cohen has looked at that in the case of South Africa, um, stress and not only stress from their paid jobs providing care in hospitals, but also then coming home and providing more unpaid care. So I would agree and I, there's um, documented evidence in support of that. Thank you. And since uh, we have just one, uh, one more minute left, I had a question that I really wanted to ask you. So, so COVID-19 is a very specific type of shock. Uh, so nonetheless, can we extend some of the learnings to other shocks like climate change related severe events? Uh, what are the key learnings that we can uh, move ahead with? Yeah, um, the uh, studies that I've seen uh, from previous pandemics from natural disasters have very similar findings that unpaid work increases 
um, with these kind of disasters and that burden disproportionately falls on the shoulders of women. Um, COVID-19 is no different in that finding. I think where this pandemic is different is the scale of it, the universality, the length, and the fact that now more men are involved in performing this care work makes me more optimistic that unpaid care will be more valued in the future than it has been in the past. And I think governments are also going to um, institutionalize uh, some of these policies more so than they have in the past. Thank you very much, Iana, for this very interesting uh, session and to all of you for being part of the discussion. Uh, so we'll reconvene again in an hour for the next parallel session of the workshop. See you shortly. Thank you again.